Hello everyone, my name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all. Today we are finally going to be talking about the Army Hammer situation. This took me several days to prepare because whenever I would think I was done, something else would come out that needed to be added to the story. And this is probably the most complex thing I have ever tried to film on this channel. I have over nine pages of notes. I have links to dozens of other YouTube videos and research articles. I have had to go through hundreds of screenshots and text messages and daily mail stories. And I had to find a Playboy interview from almost a decade ago. Like there's a lot happening here that makes it very difficult to try and form a coherent story in a small amount of time. So fair warning, this is most likely going to be a pretty long video. I would recommend you watch it on one and a half or 1.25 speed if you would like to. I do that with videos all the time. There's no shame in it. If you want to click the gear icon, it'll be somewhere on the edge of the screen and that will allow you to change the playback speed if you want it to be easier to actually get through in one sitting. Now with that in mind as well, everyone should be fairly warned. This is most likely going to be a pretty upsetting, maybe even disturbing conversation. And I would highly recommend you plan for some self-care time after you watch this video. Snuggle a pet, take a bath, have a nice drink, something along those lines that will help you calm down and relax because I know for me, even just researching this, was pretty upsetting and I wanna make sure that everyone can adequately <laughs> prepare for that and not be surprised because as I have already mentioned a few times here, there's a lot going on. Now, I think the way that I want to handle covering this, the thing that I think will be the most helpful is me talking about my perspective as a member of the BDSM community. If you don't know who I am, hi, hello, my name is Evie once again, and I have been making YouTube videos for about five years now. I have been an active member of the BDSM community for a little bit over six years, and I really think that one of the main things that has been missing from this conversation about the allegations that have come out is the perspective of somebody that is in the BDSM world. And what I have seen is there's just a lot of missteps and misunderstandings that happen when you're trying to look at this only through a vanilla perspective. And hope I can kind of point out where those things are because I think what I want to do is describe what is normal for BDSM. What isn't normal in this situation? What were the red flags? Talking about things like consent and abuse within the context of BDSM because I think if you're only trying to look at this from a vanilla idea of relationships, it becomes very confusing to try and separate, okay, what is like good consensual kink versus what's going too far. And that is where I think I can really help. Now, I know a lot of you watching this, maybe you don't have any idea who Army Hammer even is. So I think before I get into the bulk of what the current controversy is, I want to start by outlining how we even got to that place and who the heck ARMY is because I definitely didn't know before I started to research for this video. So I guess let's start there. Who is ARMY Hammer? Army Hammer is a 34 year old American actor who is most well known for his roles in the movies The Social Network and Call Me By Your Name. His great grandfather was an oil tycoon and a successful businessman and his father owned both a book publishing company as well as a movie and TV production company. Army dropped out of high school in order to pursue acting and although he signed up for a few classes at UCLA, he never completed them. 
In 2010, around the time of the release of The Social Network, he married his wife, Elizabeth Chambers. Now, it is important to note that he is currently going through a divorce and custody dispute with Elizabeth over his two children, and this ongoing dispute started before the allegations towards Army came out in the public. But we're not here to discuss his acting credentials, so I'll just go ahead and leave it there for now. What we are here to discuss is some of the interesting proclivities that he has hinted at over the years he's been in Hollywood, culminating with an explosive expose that came out a few weeks ago. As Army hasn't exactly been coy about his sexual interests, he actually did an interview with Playboy in 2013 where he said the following, Well, if you're married to a feminist, as I am, then it's... I don't know how much we can put here without my parents being embarrassed, but I used to like being a dominant lover. I liked the grabbing of the neck and the hair and all of that, but then you get married and your sexual appetites change. And I mean that for the better. It's not like I'm suffering in any way, but you can't really pull your wife's hair. It gets to a point where you say, I respect you too much to do these things that I kind of want to do. Now, as an interesting side note, one of the things that they also ask him in this interview is where his obsession with tying knots comes from. And at this time, some of the things he would later do on social media hadn't come out yet, but it is a very telling question. Now, Army Hammer originally blamed this interview on being drunk and saying too much, something that happens a lot over the course of the story, Army likes to drink and then maybe get a little bit too truthful, or at least that's how he frames it. But of course, this wouldn't be the only time that he alluded in public to his less than vanilla sexual interests. And it certainly seems to not have been something that he left behind when he married Elizabeth. In 2017, he actually had a minor scandal for liking a series of posts on his public media accounts related to shibari and latex, as well as other forms of BDSM. And what I find particularly interesting about this is that you can still see these likes. If you go to his Twitter account, assuming it hasn't been deactivated between when I'm filming this and when you guys see this video, if you go to like March 2017 and his like history, they're still there. And I don't know why him or his publicist or his PR people like didn't think to unlike these photos. And it's really interesting because it is only from like a one month chunk of time. And he'd been on Twitter for a while before that. So what he has said, what has kind of been talked about is that, oh, well, maybe he just like didn't know that you couldn't see likes on Twitter. And I, I have a little bit of a hard time believing that. What I think happened here is one, he was really trying desperately to get some publicity. And he knew from his 2013 article with Playboy that people would talk about him if he kind of alluded to like his kinky interests, right? Ooh, yeah, this is gonna get me attention because he was really trying to get lead roles in successful Hollywood films and that wasn't really happening for him. So maybe it's a little bit of like a, ooh, kind of, you know, drumming up some controversy to get some attention on myself, you know, help my brand, something like that. However, Knowing what I know later in this story, I don't even necessarily think it was that. I think the second option that might even be more likely is he was trying to like things in order to attract people that also shared his BDSM interests. And this is a way of him kind of like subtly signaling to people like, hey, like DM me if we have like the same kinky stuff going on, you know? And frankly, as we will see, it might have worked a little bit. Now, at the same time he was liking these posts on his public Twitter account, he was also following a number of very kinky profiles on Instagram, as well as following a number of kink-related hashtags. The one that I find most interesting that I would love to ask him about is one that posted videos of women golfing in bikinis. A Page Six article had this to say about the situation. Army Hammer's followed Instagram hashtags include Shibari, a form of Japanese rope bondage and knife skills. Alarming revelations following this week's news about the actor's alleged sexual proclivities. Additionally, Hammer, 34, follows Russian clothing brand Dr. Harness, which specializes in not just leather lingerie, but bondage gear, including ball gags, collars, and restraints. And Russian photographer Viktor Alenchuk, 
who goes by Fetish Deluxe, on the platform and specializes in glammy, bondage-inspired shoots. While the knife skills hashtag is mostly attached to cooking videos, it does seem somewhat tainted after Hammer's ex, Courtney Vuchkovich, claimed he told her he wanted to, quote, barbecue and eat her. Now, I know what you're thinking. One, Evie, you have terribly mispronounced that woman's last name, to which I can only say, I'm sorry, I tried my best. <laughs> Two is, um, Evie, how did we go from bikini golf ladies to wanting to barbecue a woman's rib? And this is really the segue we have to get into the full Arnie Hammer story because it's not just illusions in a Playboy interview. It's not just things that he liked on Twitter three or four years ago. It's pretty intense. So let's go ahead and get into it. What exactly is being said about Army Hammer in the year of 2021 and what allegations have come out? Now, personally, what I thought was happening when I first heard about this story was that it was about Army like cold calling people on Instagram, Twitter, other places with his very unique fetishes and basically trying to find people that would role play along with him in DMs. And that instantly brought me back to my very early days on FetLife because there are a lot of people that do stuff like this where they have no idea who you are, you're maybe not even following each other, it's just a random stranger who for whatever reason decides it's a really good idea to email you or DM you a really detailed five paragraph essay about all the ways they want to kidnap you and and beat you senseless and train you to be a perfect dog or whatever else and they just are literally jerking off in one hand and typing in the other and I was fully prepared to have a whole rant about that and talk about like boundaries with strangers online but it's not even that. It's 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 not even him cold calling people and that would be bad enough on its own. No. This is about him having multiple ongoing relationships with women where this came up over a period of years starting at least in 2016 with somebody who goes by the Instagram account of House of Effie. And to Put it just really quickly, there are at least four to five other women that have very similar stories to her, which we will talk about, that have had similar experiences with him over the years. She actually originally started following him and they messaged back and forth on Instagram because she was a fan. And then from there, they started a relationship. And since that time in 2016, she has literally hundreds of text messages and DMs and conversations and situations that she has been through with Arnie Hammer that are of course all alleged, but that do paint a very particular picture of who this man is. And I think the way that I want to break this down is I want to talk about Arnie's like fetish interests and his BDSM interests and how he expresses those and then talk about like the red flags, the consent issues and the problems separately because what I really think has happened here is people have so sensationalized all of the kinky aspects of this, they're forgetting about that second component that's the real issue. So first, what I want to do is talk about Arnie's interests. Are they normal in BDSM? Are they not normal? Is how he approaches them, the problem, so on and so forth, and then get into what I think is actually the bigger issue here. So I'm gonna break this down by like general category of interests and kind of work our way up the intensity spectrum. So if at any time you need to pause this or skip over something, totally okay, totally makes sense. Most things in here are not going to be for everyone. And the first thing I want to tackle is his use of CNC and rape fantasies as allegedly part of his relationships and part of his play. Now, I did already talk about this extensively in the video that I did about Belle Delphine, so I won't get too much into the nitty gritty of the definitions here, but suffice to say, the crime of rape is separate from the fantasy of something about the act. I actually prefer the term 
ravishment fantasy because I think it more accurately represents what these things are about. The temporary loss of power, the being overwhelmed by a stronger force, somebody desiring you so much that they would be willing to commit a crime to have you, as opposed to trying to directly replicate the actual horrific crime that I think most of us, most normal people would never ever want to have happen. He says multiple times in text messages that he is quote, thinking about me raping you, or similar things along those lines. And he acknowledges in later text messages that they had, quote, mutually organized CNC experiences. And this comes across like the language of somebody that at least knows a little bit about BDSM, particularly when he uses the term CNC. And his use of the word rape as in like, I'm thinking about raping you, I think that kind of language can be hot for people that have things like rape fantasies, that want to do things like ravishment play and CNC, and it can actually, for some people, make it hotter to like have that kind of verbal connotation to the crime because it like it makes it more taboo and bad, and that can actually be a good thing for people that are into stuff like that. So while I think the language comes across as, as crass because of what we now know about this whole story, I don't think it's necessarily unusual to use language like that even in a consensual situation because it can be kind of a way of of flirting almost in this strange fashion when you have a partner where you both mutually enjoy things like this. It's kind of like saying, oh, hey, I'm thinking about you, but it's in this kind of like dark and sexy way, or at least I think that's like how he was trying to make it come across as. Now, of course, with these text messages coming to light as part of an abuse allegation, it doesn't paint maybe the same kind of like, unusual romantic and kind of flirty picture it would in maybe a different context. They're unconventional, they're definitely not vanilla, but I don't think this is like ARMY admitting to having committed a crime the way that some people seem to be reading these messages to say. Now, the next big theme in a lot of these text messages would be DS or master and slave fantasies. We remember from the 2013 Playboy article that he said he used to like to be a dominant lover. Well, it seems that he didn't really leave those proclivities in the past. He would say things like being with them made him feel like a god, that he had a desire to brand them, tattoo them, mark them, or shave their head, and that they, quote, just live to obey and be my slave. And he would incorporate these with his other fantasies going along with other things that he was into. And it seems in particular from these messages that he was really drawn to a subset of power exchange known as MS or master and slave. Now, when practiced in real life as a core part of a relationship, this is a relatively uncommon thing to have in BDSM. Lots of people do power exchange. Not very many people do it to the extent of like a real 24 seven in-person master and slave type relationship. However, just because it's not commonly practiced in real life to its fullest extent, doesn't mean that people don't fantasize about it. And I think it's much, much, much more common to do what we see in these text messages, which is like have it be part of a hot fantasy, like foreplay kind of like sexting scenario where like the words master and slave are really hot, even if you don't like carry that out into the other parts, especially in your real life relationship that you do every day. It's more about being able to have that fantasy of complete control. And I think that really goes back to maybe the same core parts as having ravishment fantasies. To have that desire to completely possess someone, to have control over them, to have that depth of devotion and commitment in a relationship, I think those can go back to really similar places. And even some of the ideas that he expresses here, like wanting to shave their heads or being able to tattoo them, aren't necessarily uncommon as part of a fantasy in BDSM. I have certainly seen a lot of stories like that, and it is something that people do do occasionally in the real life BDSM community, but typically only within very committed long-term BDSM relationships, similar to the decision to get married. 
And yes, I think these things are very extreme for most people, but I also think Fantasyland is one of those safe places where you can explore very extreme or potentially unsafe ideas with a partner. And I think we have to remember as well with these text messages, assuming that they do actually exist, and I should always remember to say multiple times, this is all allegedly, these text messages have not even been proven, verified to really exist. You know, um, I, I get the sense that these things only ever really state a fantasy, like with the, with the like sh head shaving and things like that, and not something that necessarily went into actually practicing them as, as part of a relationship. And I think here, again, this isn't necessarily damn army by himself just for having these fantasies. It's, more that he leans into like oversharing and 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 really really wanting to have this very very detailed fantasy with this particular individual that maybe they didn't necessarily share in and speaking of oversharing this leads us to the most prominent most talked about aspect of all these allegations which is the cannibal fantasies. It is the most prominent thing that he talks about and almost everything that I have shared up to this point has been within the context of some kind of cannibalistic or vor type of desire. He talks extensively about being quote 100% cannibal, wanting to eat someone's heart, fuck somebody's literal brains, or drink their blood as well as a bunch of other things but I think those descriptions alone are maybe enough to paint a pretty good picture of what he wants to do. And this is really the heart of the story, not to make a bad pun there, that I think a lot of the news outlets are really focusing on like, wow, oh my gosh, like, can you believe this guy like says he wants to like eat somebody's heart? Can you believe he wants to keep one of their toes? Oh my God, isn't that crazy? And I think that's just really, really, really missing something here because vor fantasies and the vor fetish as a whole is uncommon. It is something that is like mostly shared online and stays a fantasy. Of course, our associations with cannibalism as like a public tend to be with really prolific serial killers. And so it's hard to imagine that anybody would like share these fantasies without ever intending to act on them. But for the vast majority of people that have fantasies like this, it's never something they really want to do in real life. The extent of it is engaging in fantasy role play with a partner. And I think we should be careful to not lose sight of that when it comes to talking about this fetish as a whole versus ARMY's actions. And this is my very, very, very hot take here. I don't think his cannibal fantasies taken in isolation are really the problem here. I do think that they are uncommon in BDSM spaces. Not a lot of people would openly disclose wanting to eat another person or be eaten in a BDSM space, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. And just because you have a fantasy about something doesn't necessarily mean that you then want to do it in real life or really want to eat your partner. Again, it tends to stay just in a fantasy place. So the issue that I really see from this is, is not the fact that he has a particular fantasy, but the way that he chooses to act on it. And I think most of the conversation here will come back to that. It's not having the fantasy, it's what he chooses to do with this fantasy. Now, what I find interesting is in these text messages, in a lot of them actually, you really just see Army like talking to a brick wall. Like he's sending fantasy after fantasy after text messages after text messages. Like it's like dozens of messages in a row with no replies from his partner at all. One way or the other, not saying stop, not saying, wow, this is really hot. And I don't know, I mean, again, we don't know that these text messages really exist. They haven't been verified or not. I don't know if maybe one side of the conversation was deleted. I don't know if those messages and replies were erased. Some of them do seem like maybe part of the conversation is missing, but that's neither here nor there. What I think is, is upsetting about this is when you are sharing something that is so likely to be upsetting to somebody, it is worth checking in 
when your partner stops responding to you, like if you send like a really detailed fantasy about like wanting to eat your partner's heart or like fuck their actual brains, maybe it's a good idea to be like, hey, are you okay with hearing this? How are you doing? How are you processing this? And ARMY just kind of seems to lack that level of empathetic response to his partners. And I can absolutely see Army's perspective here, what I think he thinks is happening, right? In these messages, I really get the impression that he has kind of like trapped himself in this vanilla marriage. Maybe he really loves Elizabeth. Maybe it was just for appearances. He felt like he could kind of like quash down his desires. And then over the years, he kind of went, no, actually I need this. And he found a non-ethical way to try and get those needs met by cheating, by messaging young women behind his wife's back. And then when he would talk to them, he would think that he would find people that were open to his interests, right? He's like, oh my gosh, I finally found somebody who understands my kink. I can finally share all these things, right? And then just word vomit constantly about all of his fantasies, kind of regardless of how those people really responded. Like a little bit of a, ha ha, okay, like is not necessarily an invitation to say more. I think sometimes, especially when something is so shocking, we don't necessarily know how to respond in the moment. Like you're like, uh, I don't know what to do with that information. Like, what do you want me to, <laughs> what do you want me to say to that? You know? And so I think he, he seems to have genuinely believed that he found somebody that he could be totally vulnerable with in how dark and deep these fantasies were without ever really considering the person at the other end of the equation. And that's the nicest thing I can say about how he handles the situation because it gets way worse from here. Though we have overshadowed everything because, oh my God, cannibal fantasies, I think the real issue with ARMY is his consent practices, is his abuse of these women. And now I'm going to get into a breakdown of where I think those things are based on these text messages, based on these conversations. So again, this is going to be intense, this is gonna be upsetting, prepare yourselves. The first thing that I see happen that's really prominent, that stuck out to me right away is ARMY's lack of using safe words. Now, you don't have to use safe words in BDSM, but it is a really good idea. The people I know that don't use safe words are experienced BDSM players, both of them, and they have five, 10, 15 years of playing with each other, of really, really knowing each other on a very deep level, and they can safely play without safe words under those circumstances. However, the way that ARMY seems to approach not having safe words is in the fuck boy, BDSM online dom kind of way where like real submissives don't use safe words. Like he jokes after having a conversation with somebody about a scene that they did that like, oh ha ha, like we didn't have a safe word. That always seems like it could have been a bad idea. Like, yeah, it was kind of a bad idea, ARMY. Uh, that's definitely gonna come back to bite you in the ass. And it comes up again in other messages where like the lack of safe word was clearly a problem. And I think based on the pattern of like women he tends to try and have these relationships with, women who are fairly young, women who are at the oldest, maybe their early 20s that don't tend to have a lot of relationship experience, don't tend to have a lot of BDSM experience. He says that, you know, oh, like safe words ruin the moment and they go, oh, okay, I guess we don't have safe words. And when you are also that young and maybe insecure, maybe you don't even really know what you want yet, the more you remove communication tools, the easier it is to make mistakes, the easier it is to violate somebody's consent. And the person even says that they wanted it to stop for most of the time in those text messages. That is exactly when you should have a safe word. You know, pushing boundaries in a pre-planned way is one thing. Having it happen when you have no control over the situation and no real way to stop it when somebody is like six foot five and two to three times your body weight, like that's gonna not be a great consent situation even under the best of circumstances. And so, the the not having safe words by itself and being dismissive of them is just a giant, giant red flag and definitely something that is a big problem for me. Now, number two is a little bit more complicated and this would be poor execution of aftercare and negotiation. 
His MO really seems to have been that he would find women to have very quick, intense relationships with, where he would give them very detailed fantasies about what he wanted. They would have very intense scenes. And then when that got too much for him, he would ghost them. He wouldn't hold up his end of the bargain. And there seems to have been a pattern where either there wasn't aftercare or there wasn't a sufficient plan for aftercare or aftercare was needed and then he skipped out on it or there couldn't have even been a possibility of it because he ghosted them, you know? And like safe words, aftercare is not necessarily something you have to have. For myself, there are some scenes where I don't need aftercare afterwards and I've had years of experience to tell me that about myself, but aftercare, unless you negotiate otherwise, I think especially if you're playing with a new person, should always be something you at least bring up and make plans for. Like, hey, you know, we're gonna do this intense CNC scene, what should we do for aftercare afterwards? How should I help you? And if your partner makes their needs known that they need aftercare, I think especially the more intense your play is, the greater of an obligation you have to try and meet those needs, especially if you negotiate for it ahead of time, right? Like if you're gonna do a really, really intense C and C scene and then your partner says, okay, well then I need you to spend the night with me afterwards or I need you to cuddle me and watch a movie together, right? You can always say, hey, I'm not available for that, you know? Oh, I have to fly home. I have this big work meeting, you know, really, really early the next morning, so I need to actually go home and get ready for that. Things like that, right? You can say, that you're not able to meet those expectations, but then you have to one, communicate you can't meet those expectations. And then you have to be willing to take the consequences if you then decide to engage in play anyways, right? You have to be able to go, okay, well, you know, I'm not gonna be available for aftercare. Are we still okay doing this scene anyways? Yes or no. Personally, I would always err on the side of like, hey, you know, you're not gonna get your aftercare needs met let's do this another time. Let's cancel doing the scene. Let's do something else that's a little bit less intense where we can get your needs accommodated. And if you decide to do the scene anyways, no aftercare or just not even establishing what your partner's needs are, you have to be prepared to face those consequences. And again, because Army has a lack of that empathetic connection with a lot of his partners, it seems, he just can't do that. Now, he does seem to be able to admit when confronted that he isn't able to always provide adequate aftercare, but it's definitely far too little, far too late, at least in my opinion. And besides his aftercare problems, he again has issues overall with his negotiation process and making sure he sticks to the plan that he says he's going to stick to. I think for me, the thing that was hardest to see was this situation where he had planned out a scene with a partner, or at least talked about doing something with a partner, where he wanted to choke them with a belt. And this person said, that seems dangerous, or no, I don't wanna do that, right? They had established that they were uncomfortable, that they thought it was dangerous, they didn't really wanna do it. And Army kind of prods them and is like, oh, well, you know, I'm not gonna clasp the belt closed, right? And then you see pictures, allegedly, of the results of this scene. And it's very clear that he clasped the belt anyways, even knowing that his partner was uncomfortable with the idea of the scene at all. There is a non-zero chance that consent changed in other text messages we haven't seen, that it changed in the moment. But I think if you're gonna do something like that, even when your partner has expressed discomfort about the idea, you are the kind of person that values your own pleasure and satisfaction over the mutual pleasure that you have with a partner. And this is so important because I think people get this idea that in BDSM, you know, tops and sadists and everybody, they're really self-centered and they don't care about anyone else's, whatever they want, and they'll push and push and push and push. The best people I know that do BDSM on that side of the dynamic are people that are genuinely invested in making it a mutually enjoyable experience. And they would never go forward with a scene where a partner had expressed such discomfort at a particular act. 
And they would never lie about agreeing to not do something and then doing it anyways because they thought they could get away with it and the person would say no. Because again, they don't have safe words, right? We have established earlier, they don't play with safe words. And then they're gonna do a choking scene with a belt. If it does get clasped closed, the person that is subjected to that, like you can't talk in that scenario, There's no way for you to be able to successfully revoke consent and remind your partner you don't want to do that in that situation, which is just horrifying. And this is why those communication tools are so important. And I mean, it's likely over the course of your time in BDSM that you will make mistakes with partners, right? They will tell you in advance, like weeks before, that they're not into something and then it accidentally happens during a scene, right? Or you forget or you don't understand how important it is. Like those kind of little oopsies can happen, but this occurs within the context of so many things like this happening that it's hard to believe that Arnie genuinely cares about the women that he's doing these scenes with enough to really stop when it gets in the way of his pleasure because we have no instances, no evidence of a time where he did stop when something made someone uncomfortable, when he did choose to do the right thing. And that in and of itself is disturbing. And then to really just put the icing on the cake of that whole situation, not only did this person have something happen that they expressed discomfort over and they didn't want to have happen, they also still didn't get the aftercare that they needed. And while I was writing this, another story came out from another partner named Paige that I think really just demonstrates this is truly a pattern of behavior across multiple partnerships. Because according to her, within the first night that they were together, he insisted that he would be called either daddy or sir. And later on, He had an out of control scene with her where he allegedly carved his first initial into her abdomen, like kind of between her pubic bone and her abdomen. There's a very small A, there's a photo of it um, from the article that I read. It just really seems like he is the kind of person that can't control himself when his own pleasure is involved, when he finally gets to do the thing that he really wants to do, right? Oh my God, I get to do BDSM with this person. His own ability to rein himself in when he hasn't negotiated for something goes completely out the window. And with his relationship with Paige, it was at most two months long, right? And so even if he did it the night before that they broke up, like, He was at the point where he wanted to carve an initial in her. And these things, when you do play like that, it will scar. It will leave a scar. And that initial will be on her for forever. And we have no evidence that they negotiated for this. They talked about it ahead of time. And I imagine based on the way that she frames the event, if we do take her account as truthful, which I would, that he didn't talk about it ahead of time. He just drew a knife. And so we're left with this picture of like an out of control sex scene where he suddenly like pulls a knife out and then carves his initial on her pubic area. And just not something you really see from an ethical and thoughtful member of the BDSM community. That's what I would say. You know, I think doing things like that, you know, choking with the belt, not advisable. A lot of people do find it hot, however, and do it anyways. Not really my preferred technique for breath control, but people do do it. That part isn't unusual. Even carving your initial on somebody, carving on somebody's back. I've done blood play. I I have many scars over a lot of different parts of my body from things that I've done with partners, but they were things that we really carefully talked about ahead of time, where we talked about the risks of what would happen. We talked about when we were going to do this, the where, everything, you know, everything was completely negotiated, completely under everyone's control in that scene. And ARMY just doesn't do that. And the scariest thing in the world is a dom with no safe words that can't control themselves. Because at some point they stop being a dom and they're just an abuser. And really my final thought on this section I, w- I want to point out here is that like he is not invested in teaching 
his partners about the risks of the things that they're doing at all, right? Whether that be choking or, 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 or cutting or anything like that, right? Like he's playing with people that don't otherwise have experience with BDSM, allegedly. You know, he's playing with people that are very, very young and he doesn't think to inform them about what they're going to be doing or what it would mean to them or that it might scar or that it might leave bruises on their neck for weeks, for months afterwards. And again, it just, it demonstrates that lack of empathy that he has towards his partners because he values his own pleasure so much that he wouldn't want to say or do anything really that would prevent him from having access to that. Now, the next point here is really getting away from BDSM and talking about these relationships as a whole because one of the big things that ARMY does is he misrepresents the nature of the relationship that he's having with these women, right? Okay, first of all, all of this is based on him cheating on his wife and having, you know, a half dozen other women he's sleeping with around the world behind her back, you know? And not only is he doing that to his wife, he's also doing that to the other women, you know? He says things like, you're the only slave I can ever imagine, right? where he has like six other slaves at the same time. You know, he's very possessive over them. They're not allowed to date other people while he's dating them, even if he goes days, weeks, months, maybe even years between seeing them, right? We don't know. And they're not allowed to date anyone else because he wants to possess them and control them, even though he doesn't offer that same sort of courtesy to them, right, of that exclusivity. And he has this pattern of saying things and talking about these women in a way where it's trying to make them feel special. It's trying to, to, to make them feel like they're the one and only, right? They're the most special thing in his life. You know, nobody else, even if he is seeing other people, can compare to that. And what that does is, one, it creates division so these women can't coordinate with each other uh and i don't use this term lightly but it it does come across like grooming behavior to do things like that, where you build people up and you make them feel, oh, you're so special and my one and only, when the reality is anything but that. And I think if these women came out and called that behavior gaslighting, they would be correct in saying that. And I think if you want to be ethically non-monogamous, be ethically non-monogamous. This is not that. Cheating and, and, and lying about the nature of the relationship is putting everybody at risk for so many things, mentally, emotionally, physically, STI risks, Lord even knows what else, you know? Just lying and deceit is, is just evidence, again, again, of his lack of empathy for these women in his life, that he doesn't even think he needs to disclose these things when he expects exclusivity and purity from them, you know, this very two-sided approach, even in BDSM, especially when you consider the fact that this behavior was also coupled extensively with ghosting behavior as well. Not only would he lead these women to believe that they were so special and he would lead them on for months or even longer, as soon as he got what he wanted, he would vanish. And maybe he would come back later because he wanted more, you know, but he didn't care enough about their feelings and their perspectives and what they wanted from the relationship. He just wanted what he wanted and would leave after he got that or got too intense for him to be able to handle. And this isn't just coming from one source. Another one of his exes came out in a different story and said that, quote, Army is consuming. I mean, mentally, physically, emotionally, financially, just everything. Indicating this is really a pattern in a lot of his relationships. He seeks to consume women, control them completely, not in a fun, consensual BDSM type of way, but in a very real, uncontrolled, unnegotiated, and dangerous fashion that are the hallmarks of abuse. And the last big topic I want to cover here is that he can't accept responsibility for 
his actions. Now, from House of Effie, allegedly before those accusations were brought publicly, she encouraged Army to come out on his own and apologize to the women that he hurt. And he refused to do so, which pushed her hand, which made her kind of come out and, and do this more publicly than she originally wanted to. And even in the relationships themselves, when they were still around, he had this very like slidey way of approaching things, right? Like he would kind of like half apologize or admit where he did something wrong, but he seems to be unable to see himself as a bad guy. When women come forward and tell him, you know, you raped me, you abused me, you harmed me for years, he goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Technically speaking, I'm not a rapist. And he goes into this whole diatribe about why he's not a rapist, right? And it's like, whoa, like, like, the time to defend yourself is not right now. Like, you, you, sorry, this is, this is the hardest part of the video to talk about for me because it's like, when people can't take accountability for the harm that they've caused at least, that is so frustrating because it costs you nothing to say, yes, I know that I've hurt you and I'm sorry and I acknowledge your pain, right? That costs you nothing. You just start from that place of saying, yes, I see your pain. I see the harm that I've caused and I accept that. What do you need for me? What can I do for you? And his inability to do that. And in fact, even if he can kind of superficially seemingly play along with, you know, saying I'm sorry or admitting where he did things wrong, he can't accept the totality of it. And, and when it comes down to it, he gets angry, he shuts down, he runs away, he says, fuck you, screw you, you're wrong, and then just leaves the conversation, right? So nobody ends up getting closure. Nobody ends up getting a real, real apology in any of this. And I do really think, I genuinely think, that Army does not see himself, at least right now, as a bad guy. He does not think that he has harmed these women. He does not think that he has abused them. He does not think that he has raped them. He thinks that he's a good person. And because he can never change that idea about himself in his head, it means everyone else around him has to be wrong about everything that they say. And his ego is just way too wrapped up in it because even if you don't think you have harmed someone, you can still have harmed them. This is maybe a little bit of a complex issue to see, but like just because you experience something as not being abusive doesn't mean the other person didn't have that experience differently. And his inability to see that is yet again, put a tally in the corner, everyone. How many times have we said this in this video? It is evidence of his lack of empathy towards his partners and his inability to truly genuinely care about their feelings and the way that he treated them. So we're at the end of this conversation, I think. We've, we've gone over the bulk of, of everything that I could find in terms of allegations and behaviors and interests that Army has. And now that we're there, what does this say about Army Hammer? What should be our takeaway from this situation? If you focus so much on being like, ooh, wow, that's like gross and disgusting, then you're not getting to the heart of the issue because the issue isn't the fantasies themselves. Again, it's how he chose to act on them. It's how he chose to act with his partners. It's how he chose to conduct these relationships. That is the issue. And the more that we focus on the like, ooh, gross, kink is bad, BDSM bad, like the more we're missing out on opportunities to have the conversations we need to have about consent and boundaries and how to have healthy relationships and red flags and all the things that I hope I was able to cover at least a little bit in my response to this whole situation so far. And I think what we really need to address is not his kinks, but his repeated lack of care for his partners, the fact he pursues young women that are mostly also fans, the fact that he is a cheater and a liar, the fact that he can't own up to his own dangerous tendencies, the fact that he gets out of control during scenes, the fact that he's poor at negotiating in the first place, the fact that he doesn't believe in safe words, the fact that he can't keep his word to his partners, that he misrepresents relationships, that he can't follow through on aftercare, that he ghosts people. like. These are the problems with ARMY, and he is 
allegedly, an abuser, but it's not because of the BDSM. If he is a bad person, if he is truly an abuser, if these things about him are true, he is abusive and bad because of who he is and how he behaves and how he thinks about other people. Not because of the BDSM, not because he has a particular fetish or whatever, but because of his worldview of how he sees women, of how he sees partners, of how he sees himself. You know, you can have fucked up fantasies about really weird and out there shit and still be a good person, right? Fantasies do not make you a bad person. Being a bad person <laughs> makes you a bad person. And I know this because I know people personally that have all the same fantasies that ARMY has. And they know how to conduct themselves appropriately. They know how to enter BDSM spaces and respect others. They know how to treat their partners. And ARMY doesn't. It's not because he wants to fuck somebody's brains. It's because he just doesn't care about other people the way that he should. Hello everyone, this is Editing Evie, popping in really quick just to give you all an update. I tried to be as thorough as possible while filming. Unfortunately, some things have come out since then that I thought I would share with you all. One is that several of the women that have come forward to share their stories talking about Army Hammer are allegedly underaged or were underaged at the time the abuse took place, anywhere between 15 and 17, depending on the individual. That is not everyone that had an interaction with him, but several of them, which does add an extra layer to these allegations. The second is that he is now also being accused of potentially abusing animals, including his own dog. Supposedly, he had a conversation where he disclosed he was absentmindedly choking his dog while thinking about one of his other partners, and there were some other disturbing videos and conversations that were also released, and this is particularly troubling. We think about it in the context of some of the other comments he's made about hunting down a deer and eating a raw deer's heart. And of course, with the whole fact that animal abuse is connected to domestic violence and is also connected most famously to serial killers, especially when it starts from a young age, which really goes back into this whole cannibalism narrative that has really been at the forefront of this conversation. Now, all of this is obviously still alleged, and unfortunately, much of the information about this was on the House of Effie Instagram page, which sometime in the last two hours appears to have gone offline. So, I don't have as much direct information as I would like to, but I did want to get that out there because I know it would be important for many of you to at least hear about it, that it happened, that it came out, and that's really everything I have at the moment. And I will get back into the rest of our conversation. Bye. And this is the part that I had to take the longest to think about because it was the most confusing out of everything, right? Because over the years, you know, like probably at least twice a year, there's a news story about somebody that abuses somebody, rapes somebody, kills somebody, and they blame BDSM for it, right? They're like, oh, this was like a consensual BDSM scene gone wrong, or this victim deserved it because they were a submissive, or they had kinky fantasies themselves, and that defense pretty much never works, but people still attempt it, and it tends to be something that retroactively gets applied in order to explain a crime, even if the people, like, weren't actually really into BDSM. It's just a defense maneuver, essentially. But the sense that I get from ARMY is, is not somebody that doesn't know about BDSM. Like, he knows what a safe word is. He knows about aftercare. He knows about CNC. And it even goes beyond the knowledge that you would get from, like, watching BDSM pornography. You know, it's, it's something that he would have to have genuinely read about BDSM in order to find out, most likely. And so... I just don't know what ARMY's true relationship with kink is. Is he 
Like, is he the kind of person that has such a different sense of self from who his real self is that, like, he thinks he knows what he's doing even if he's doing everything wrong? Like, does he think he's doing the right things and, like, kind of going through the correct motions and just doesn't understand, like, where he's making mistakes? And, like, how are you the kind of person that knows enough about BDSM, is interested enough in it to, like, follow famous rope bondage photographers and follow tutorials for how to tie somebody up and and know what CNC is and know about aftercare and not have internalized, like, what the healthy good practices are is like he just looked at the parts that he found hot that he wanted to like keep in his brain and then like the rest of it was just like boop, gone bye see you later and that is really unsettling to sit with because i think one of the main ways that i've rooted out potentially harmful people and, and one of the things that i tell people to do right is like pay attention to their language, right? Do they really seem to know what BDSM is? Or are they trying to like play along with it to kind of like get you into the position they want you to be in to be able to harm you? And I think ARMY really thinks that he knows what BDSM is about. I think he really thinks that he's doing kink correctly and is just, for some reason, totally, consciously, willfully oblivious to the harm that he causes others because of his actions. And he just thinks that he's doing the right thing. And that's like, like, honestly, I would almost rather him be like a meditative, like very thoughtful, purposeful psychopath that did all this in a calculated way because it would make more sense than the banality of evil. It would make more sense if it was like, wow, he really like methodically planned out how he was going to get all these women to do all these things. And he, he read all this stuff so he could, you know, manipulate these people. I don't get the sense that he's intelligent enough to do that. I get the sense that he is just fumbling around in his life and hurting people that he comes across because he literally can't control himself or stop himself from doing anything better. And I hope that what has come out, I hope that ARMY faces justice for what he's done if there's some way of doing that. I don't know if anything that has come out so far, if it is true, if it's prosecutable or not, but that he gets help, that he learns better, that he stops hurting people like this because it's the only thing that I can really hang on to that I that I have hope for, you know, really. And I hope the women involved here get, get healing from this situation, are able to move past it because I can't even imagine, like, especially when you're, when you're so young and this is in your formative years of, like, learning about adult relationships, like, how much that would negatively impact you to go through something like this, especially with somebody famous. You know, we haven't even talked about how, like, the fame aspect of this comes into it because, like, being somebody's fan, them being rich and famous, oh man, oh man, that makes the risk of coercion so much worse. So much worse. But I think at some point I have to stop talking or this video is going to be literally two hours long. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to leave it there. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my notes for everything on Patreon, like all of my thoughts. And then I'm going to put links in the description down below. I'm going to put related videos and resources down below in the description box. And I would just be really curious to know, like, what do you guys think about this? What do you think happened here? Because it's just, it's just really messy. It's, it's just really, really messy. And I would love to know what you guys think. Anything else you want to share? Anything you want to ask me about? Please go ahead and put it down in the comment section below. Thank you all so much for watching this. I promise I will have a very lighthearted, fun, nice video prepared for you guys for after this one because, oh man, this was such a conversation. So hey, if you want to see that, if you haven't already, please do subscribe. My videos twice a week about all sorts of kink and BDSM related topics. If you really enjoyed this, if you want to support what I do, as well as have access to a bunch of exclusive perks and rewards, please check out my Patreon. That is what literally makes this possible. Every dollar bill really does help. So if you want access to other things like photo shoots, a Discord server, instructional videos, a bunch of other cool things like that. Go ahead and check it out. Link will be down below. And as always, if you guys do support me over there already, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I talk to you guys again, have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye. A lot of shit was said that also most people don't relate to.
It's kink, it's niche, it's fetish, right? So that's bad. And as, as if that wasn't bad enough, think about this. You're having sex with someone and you say something to them in the heat of a moment when you're having sex. If someone else comes up to you and says, oh my God, I heard you said this to that person, like you said, out of the context, out of the heat of the moment, out of that safe place where it fucking sounds perfect to say, it's a little cringy.